Good afternoon. Um, so, this morning we saw that some of the advances in the basic science uh, that is fueling new approaches to child health come at the level of biology. And this session, we are going to see that some of the basic um, advances also can come at the level of behavior. And no better a speaker to illustrate this point than Carol Dweck. So Carol has had a longstanding interest in human motivation, in personality, and in development. And the brilliance of her work, as you'll see, is that she has made precise and astute observations of behavior and then integrated them into a theoretical perspective that can really um, influence and change child behavior. So Carol earned a BA at Barnard College and then went on and got a PhD at Yale. She has spent time in her career at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, at Harvard, at Columbia, and then she came to Stanford in 2004 as the Lewis and Virginia Eaton Professor of Psychology. Carol's enjoyed an enormous amount of national and international um, recognition. Uh, an important thing is she's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, um, and she's actually lectured at the United Nations. I think one of the most telling examples of the spread of her ideas is that my daughter, my wise daughter who lives in London, called me up one day about two years ago and said, Mom, I just read this amazing book. Um, it's going to change the way I parent. It's called Mindset by Carol Dweck. So I'd like to introduce you to Carol. And thank you, Carol, for um, influencing the raising of my granddaughters. <laughs> Thank you, Heidi. Good afternoon. Recently, a colleague sent me a picture of her five-month-old nephew who had just turned on a computer for the first time. <laughs> People, we were all this way. Almost all kids are like this. They're dying to learn. They're dying to challenge themselves. They're so excited when they make things happen. But just a few years later, we begin to see this and that. And just a few years after that, we begin to see this and this, like, take me now. How does this happen? And how can we prevent it from happening? How can we make sure all of our kids remain learners? That's what I'm going to talk about today. I study mindsets. Mindsets are beliefs about the nature and workings of human attributes. We're going to look at this when it comes to curiosity, intellect, and achievement. Then we're going to look at it in terms of adjustment and mental health, and then we'll look at it in, briefly in terms of physical health. I'll make an artificial distinction between mental and physical health. You'll forgive me for purposes of this presentation. And anyone who comes later, fill them in on that, please. So let's start with mindsets about intelligence. In our work, we find that children and adults can have different perspectives on intelligence. Some favor the view that intelligence is just a fixed trait. You have a certain amount, and that's it. Just wanted to make sure this wasn't. Um, you have a certain amount, and that's it. Some people are lucky, they have a lot, they're the chosen few, and others are not so lucky, but nothing much you can do about it. However, others favor what we call a growth mindset. It's the view that whatever intellectual abilities you have, they can be developed. 
through effort, but not just effort and hard work, learning good strategies and lots of help, input, and support and instruction from others. Now, in a growth mindset, you don't believe everyone's the same or anyone can necessarily be Einstein, but you believe that everyone has the capacity for growth. An important thing to keep in mind is it's not one or the other. As you'll see, we can have different mindsets in different domains. You can think your intelligence is fixed, but your personality can become ever more wonderful or vice versa. Also, we can, at different times, have different mindsets, in this, even in the same domain. I may, in general, believe that intelligence can be developed, but there may be triggers in the environment that sometimes make me doubt that if I'm facing a big challenge, if I'm having a setback, struggling and not making progress, if, if I see someone who's much better and more successful than me at something I thought I was great at, these are times that can trigger me into a fixed mindset. And then the idea is, how do I get back? So let's keep them in, that in mind and come back to it later. Now, people often say to me, so which mindset is true? Maybe it's good to have a growth mindset, but what's the truth? Now, as with every dichotomy, it's you know some of both. But what's so exciting is that neuroscience is showing us on a daily basis, practically, the tremendous plasticity of the brain, much greater than we ever believed. Some of my favorite findings in recent years is how... Um, uh, research by Takao Hench and others, reopening critical periods. Critical periods are or sensitive periods or time uh, when uh, particular kinds of learning are privileged. And we think that the, we used to think the window just closed or almost closed after that period. And yet, through genetic, pharmacological, and even behavioral, psychological means, we're learning how to reopen some of those critical periods to promote growth and learning again. I think you'll be interested to know that Alfred Binet, the inventor of the IQ test, had a radical growth mindset. He believed the most basic capacity to learn could be transformed through education. And that's what he spent most of his life doing, creating programs that would make kids smarter, that would transform their intelligence. So why'd he make up that test? Well... The Paris Public Schools asked him to make a test uh, that would tell them who was not on track, and then he could figure out how to get those students back on track again. Alfred Binet went crazy when uh, the Americans and the Brits started using the test to say that we were not just measuring intelligence, but fixed intelligence. He railed against that view, but he couldn't stop us. My career, my life, is dedicated to undoing that mischief, vindicating Alfred Binet with your help and the help of your grandchildren, Heidi. So let's look at how mindsets work in the domain of achievement. Recently, a few years back, we had the privilege of studying all the 10th graders in the country of Chile. 168,000 students. And what we found in this study, we were able to, uh, by the way, assess the mindsets that they favored, whether they believed intelligence was basically fixed, or instead could be developed. And then we checked in on their achievement. And what we found was that at every level of family income, 
there was a significant gap between those students who endorsed a growth versus fixed mindset and the advantage was for the kids who endorsed the growth mindset. That gap was particularly large among the poorest students. And a growth mindset was least prevalent among the poorer students. So in no way are we saying, oh, you know, forget poverty, just give them a mindset. No way, poverty obviously has so many pernicious effects. But we're beginning to think that maybe one of the ways that poverty has a negative effect on achievement is by making the idea of growth, the growth of intellectual abilities, less available. And this is something we're following up on. We also have had a lively program of research on changing students' mindsets, on seeing whether if we can promote and instill more of a growth mindset, whether this would help kids thrive over academic challenges. So we've looked at kids making the transition to junior high school or high school or college and seeing whether they are more successful academically if they approach that transition in a, a growth mindset. In one study we did, really the first study that we did, um, students were given the control group and the experimental group um, were given eight sessions of something good. The control group learned eight sessions of study skills. We worked with the teachers to find out what kinds of learning skills would be useful for kids that year, that transition to seventh grade, and that's what we taught in a lively and effective way to the students in the control group. But in the experimental group, we combined the learning skills with growth mindset, with the idea that every time you work hard on something challenging, the neurons in your brain form new or stronger connections and over time, you can get smarter. We made the analogy, the brain is like a muscle. When you exercise it, it gets stronger. And we taught them how to put this into practice in their schoolwork. We then checked in on them months later at the end of the year, and we found that the students who had just gotten, I can't point, all right, no? OK. Um, the red line, the students who had just gotten the study skills, continued to show declining grades. But the students who had gotten the study skills with growth mindset showed a rebound in their grades by the end of the year. Currently, we're in the kind of um, in the middle of a national study. We distilled the growth mindset message into two online sessions. And we conducted this experiment with a nationally representative sample across the country. Uh, some, half the students randomly selected, received the growth mindset treatment, the other half learned about the brain and its functions. By the way, we had a hard time uh, getting the control group thing to be as... The control group thing was uh, consistently more interesting than the growth mindset thing. So we had to keep making it a little, little less interesting till, till they were equal anyway. So it was a good control group. They learned about the brain. They got interested in the brain could have piqued their interest in science. Um, 
our plan was to see, here are these students making the transition to high school. This is really a choice point. Are you going to invest? Are you not going to invest? Are you going to take advanced math? You're not going to take advanced math. Are you going to end up graduating or not? Are you going to end up graduating with a portfolio that makes you qualify to go to a four-year college? Are you going to end up graduating so that you could pursue a STEM curriculum if you wanted in college? These are all questions in our study. We're following the students up to determine that. And we're writing the paper now, but I can't release the results yet. They're, they're quite promising, both in terms of helping the lower-achieving students stay on track and in terms of the lower and higher-achieving students being more likely to um, pursue more challenging and rigorous courses. But I didn't say that. Um, but I, I want to share with you some of the uh, things that we do to make a growth mindset in, in these online programs interesting and palatable to adolescents. My former student, David Yeager, just did a review of how behavior change programs are typically done with adolescents. They're preached at, they're given the information over and over, they're told what to do. And these treatments rarely work. What we try to do instead is say to these adolescents, hey, you know, we're scientists, we study learning, but you're the expert in the transition to high school, and we need your input, we need your help to make this program better. So we empower them and respect them and enlist their aid, and we ask their opinions throughout. We teach them growth mindset with the neuroscience, with the graphs, um, again, to respect their intellectual maturity. We present testimonials from older students what they learned from going through the program, how they considered using it and did use it, and from admired people in society. We also ask them at the end to mentor, to write a letter to a struggling student in terms of the growth mindset principles they learned. These letters are really wonderful and are meant really to help them internalize the message. Finally, we suddenly realized I, like everyone in this room probably, would have done anything to get smarter. You tell, you tell me, you can get smarter by doing this and this, and I say, okay, where do I start? But many kids, especially adolescents, may not have that value, and so in our more recent programs, we also included, why would you want to get smarter? What will this brain do for you? And so we ask students, what kind of contribution can you see yourself making in life? Maybe to your family, to your community, to your society. And we had them write about that. Again, the letters were pretty astounding. Uh, they could all see themselves doing something meaningful and important. And then we showed them how a stronger brain, working hard in school to strengthen their brains, could lead them toward those goals. So that's kind of a whirlwind tour of the kind of... Uh, research we've been doing, trying to get kids back on more positive trajectories. Because one theme today is the idea that in adolescence, all these new choices present themselves. 
And kids more and more are making their decisions. And how can we help them move from a poorer to a better trajectory? But I want to take a pause now. Many educators um, have implemented growth mindset in their classrooms in the most, and in the schools in the most spectacular ways. Some schools have been transformed. Some school systems have been transformed, top to bottom, in ways that kind of revolutionize the student's achievement. But other educators have um, used what I call false growth mindset. And let me back up and say how I came to understand false growth mindset. A colleague of mine in Australia uh, named Susan Mackey said to me one day, you know, Carol, I'm seeing a lot of false growth mindset. Frankly, I was annoyed. I said, what are you talking about? It's such a simple, straightforward, powerful concept. What do you mean false? And she said, it's just being misinterpreted by many. A lot of teachers, so I I said, well, okay, I'll think about it. And then you know when you learn a new word and then you hear it 10 times within two days, I started seeing it everywhere. A lot of educators were thinking, oh yeah, just tell kids, um, oh, first of all, they were just declaring that they had a growth mindset. They didn't really know what it was, but if it was good, they had it. They also thought, well, it was just about telling kids to try hard or praising them when they tried hard. That's not it at all. In fact, you could be conveying a fixed mindset. If you're telling uh, someone who's not succeeding, oh, that's great, you're trying really hard, they feel worse. How come the other kids are getting it? They're not trying that hard. Um, So just kind of boiling it down to one thing. And and some of them were uh, putting a chart in the front of the room and then criticizing students who didn't suddenly do all the growth mindset things. Some of them were sorting kids into fixed and growth mindset. I heard of a teacher who told a parent, I can't teach your son, he has a fixed mindset. So some of the teachers who used to think, well, I can't teach dumb kids are now saying I can't teach fixed mindset kids. The terms have changed, but the thinking has not really changed. And then many very earnest teachers would say growth mindset a lot in their classroom, but they weren't embodying it in their practice. The kids were not picking it up from them. And in our national study, we have a representative sample of math teachers. We will see um, what are the practices that teachers use, the teachers who have a class full of students who really believe that their math abilities can be developed, and the teachers who have a class full of students who believe some have it, some don't. In the end, growth mindset will come to fruition by creating cultures of growth mindset, cultures that embody growth mindset. And because we learned it's so difficult for teachers to generate these cultures on their own, um, colleagues of mine are creating growth mindset curricula, step-by-step growth mindset curricula, working with teachers, that will help teachers everywhere be able to create a true growth mindset culture. 
we're also studying organizations and finding that some organizations have organization-wide employees who think, yes, they believe all of us are capable of growth and they're helping to create it, as opposed to they're looking for the superstars and they don't care about the rest of us. So we're learning at an organizational level as well. How do you create a culture that makes people believe in growth, makes people believe that you believe in their growth, and creates opportunities, equal opportunities for growth throughout the organization? Well, over time we realize that, you know, growth mindset, fixed mindset, um, don't just apply to your intellectual ability. It applies to your social ability, your personality. And we realized, led by my former student David Yeager, that adolescence was a time when these personality mindsets really, really mattered. There's this social hierarchy, it's unstable, kids are jockeying for their place on the hierarchy, there's a lot of exclusion, a lot of rejection, there's bullying. How do kids navigate this? So the first place we looked was in high schools, and we looked at aggression in the face of exclusion. And our thinking was, the more you think personality is fixed, and we had evidence for this, the more you feel when you're rejected or excluded, whoa, I'm not a worthy person, I'm not a likable person, I'm more of a loser, I'm more of a victim, and I also hate the fixed person who bullied me. They're a bad person. They're uh, deserving of revenge. So we saw that the created kind of a tornado of shame and hate leading to retaliation. And we wondered that if we taught, no, 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 people don't do things because they're good or bad. They do things because they have thoughts and feelings, personality, that lives in their brain and can be changed. For his dissertation, part of his dissertation, David found a school in the Bay Area that had high levels of aggression. The teachers said, the staff said, the principal said, look, don't bother with these kids, it's too late. Talk about fixed mindset. But he knew that that's where he wanted to do his study. Um, So I, I won't go into great detail, but to say the high school students were divided into three groups. One group got state of the art social coping skills, one was a no treatment control, and the third was growth mindset. How do you look at yourself? How do you look at others in terms of capability for growth? And again, in the growth mindset treatment, they were told people's personalities live in their brains, and the brain can be changed. People do things because of the thoughts and feelings they have, thoughts and feelings that live in the brain and can be changed. They were taught, look, change isn't easy, it's not assured, and it's certainly not your job to change anyone else, but the capability for change is inherent in every person. And then they were shown how to embody that in their social interactions, and particularly when conflict occurs. We then had a number of measures at the end of the year. 
or a month later and then at the end of the year. And our favorite measure was a behavioral measure. Kids were brought to a room in their school. The first thing they did was play an online cyberball game. It's a game of catch. It's the participant and two peers, and they're throwing a virtual ball around. And at some point, the peers stop tossing the ball to the participant and just toss it to each other. So there is a feeling of exclusion temporarily. Later in the session, lo and behold, the child has an opportunity to retaliate. They are asked to allocate a certain amount of hot sauce to one of the kids who excluded them, and they have the knowledge that the child hates spicy food. How much do they allocate? They were required to give some, but how much was up to them? And what we found was that in the no treatment control and in the um, coping skills group, they gave plenty of hot sauce, like six over six heaping teaspoons. But in the growth mindset group, they gave about 40% less. David had the great idea of having kids send a note with their hot sauce. So I'm going to give you a flavor for the note, and then I'll show you the data. Here's one, a pro-social note. Look, um, it's empathic. I tried to put only a little bit of the hot sauce as I could because you circled you disliked it, so I hope it's not too much for you. It's not that spicy. I already tried it, so I hope you can handle how much I put in. As opposed to, I gave you a lot because you don't like spicy. <laughs> and because you didn't share the ball, and they smeared the sauce all <laughs> over the note. And here's the data. The no treatment control, the first bar, and the social coping skills group wrote very few pro-social notes, and the, but the Growth Mindset Group wrote almost twice as many as the No Treatment Control and three times as many as the Pro-Social. So notice, this Pro-Social, it's good. It had some beneficial effects, but it didn't actually help them cope with the setback. It didn't take away these fixed mindset beliefs and give them a new way of seeing other children and themselves when rejection takes place. David then went on to look at whether a growth mindset online intervention or self-administered intervention could potentially prevent some clinical levels of depression as kids made the transition to high school. That's the year that depression really shoots up. And he wondered, if you don't judge yourself as harshly, as you think about it, if you think about it as a time of growth and learning, rather than a time when you're finding out permanent terrible things about yourself, could this help? Again, this kind of, um, in, in this case, they didn't have the six in-person sessions, but they had um, compelling articles to read. And what he found was that there was, across three studies, and in each study, a significant reduction in kids reporting depression that reached a clinical threshold. So learning 
People can change. People can grow and develop. You know, everyone's trying to do what they have to do to cope. They're not doing it just to be mean. They're doing it for their own motivated reasons. It doesn't mean they're always going to be that way. It doesn't mean you're always going to be and feel this way. Led to um, reductions in uh, reports of depression. Jessica Schleider, working with Tom Weiss at Harvard, um, based on this work, created um, online interventions for kids coming into the clinic at, um, I think it was Mass General. The parents and the kids came into the clinic. The kids did the online intervention. And again, randomly assigned, always randomly assigned. And she found a significant decrease in report of depressive symptoms over time. So that's a nine-month period for the kids in the growth mindset condition, but not for kids in the control condition. She also found benefits for the parents as the kids themselves improved. Um, David and his colleagues have also gone on to study stress and anxiety among adolescents, finding that a growth mindset intervention um, makes them... Well, let's think about it. So you're in high school and you're always looking around. It's a threatening environment for many. They're on edge. How am I doing? Am I, oh, whoa, whoa, what was that look? Am I being excluded? Am I the next one to be bullied? What's going on? What's happening? Also, I'm struggling with schoolwork for the first time. What does that mean about me? I thought I was smart. Does it mean I'm not smart? Should I avoid challenges? So... I won't look not smart. So you have all these choices going on all the time. How do you react? Um, so David and his colleagues showed that after a self-administered growth mindset session, um, kids showed lower anxiety, less threat, when they were asked to do public speaking in front of peers, which is a standard stress situation, public speaking in front of peers who are evaluating you. So um, in the short run, that chronic stress was reduced and then showed differences over time. I mean, acute stress was reduced and then showed differences over time in chronic stress. So we've talked about um, adolescent academic transitions. We've talked about adolescent social transitions. And Claudia Mueller here, who's an assistant professor in pediatric surgery, has undertaken a series of studies now looking at physical health. First, in a group of healthy adolescents, she assessed their mindsets about physical health, asking students to agree or disagree with items like this. Your physical health is something about you you can't really change. If you're an unhealthy person, there's not much you can do about it. So as with intelligence or personality, do you have control over changing and improving that attribute or not? So it turned out that many students said they had no control, little or no control, over their health, whereas others 
thought they had control. Those who endorse more of the fixed mindset, when asked to judge kids who had um, asthma, appendicitis, or a broken leg, saw the kids as much less healthy, and they projected that they'd be less healthy over the next five years compared to students, uh, adolescents who uh, were in more of a growth mindset. So those in the fixed mindset, it's kind of you have it or you don't. And even if you have an acute affliction, like a broken leg or appendicitis, well, then you're not a healthy person and you probably won't be as healthy over the next five years. So there's this kind of uh, all-or-nothing thinking. Her next study was with adolescents with type 1 diabetes. Followed them over time. There wasn't much difference right in the beginning because parents still had a lot of control over administering the insulin. But over time, the students with more of a fixed mindset about their health were showing higher blood sugar levels and many more episodes uh, of quite high blood sugar. So when the medication was put more in their hands, when medical adherence was more up to them, they were not showing the same degree of adherence. I'm sick, I'm not sick, my body is my body, and there's not much I can do about it. The kids with more of a growth mindset were able to maintain more even blood sugars. More recently, she looked at kids who were undergoing a very painful surgery to correct kind of concavity of the chest. Um, It it involves inserting a concave bar and turning it around to push their chest out. Very, very painful. Here she found that adolescents with more of a fixed mindset experienced greater pain and continued to experience greater pain over the days they were in the hospital. And she's very interested now in whether this would lead to greater opioid administration, greater opioid administration over a long period of time, and perhaps leading to opioid dependency. Could it be a gateway? So once they think, I'm a sick person, I'm a person in pain, it may be hard to get out of that. And finally, Claudia is looking at kids with congenital heart problems, wondering whether they will excuse themselves from exercise um, that is quite healthy and beneficial for them, if they see themselves as reduced, restricted, impaired. And finally, organ transplants, uh, where... um, Adherence to medication is of the utmost importance. Will they be able to do that as well in the fixed mindset as growth? So, to conclude, I hope I've shown you that the beliefs or mindsets adolescents have about themselves and their attributes can play an important role in their health, mental health, achievement trajectories over time. I want to emphasize that the mindset environments students, people are in, are of the utmost importance. I've focused on the individual level today but the systemic, the environmental level, the mindset cultures people are in 
are tremendously important in not only instilling the idea of growth and development, but maintaining it over time. I'm also very, very interested in mindsets as catalysts for other programs. I've talked to you about more freestanding mindset programs, but what about mindsets combined with other interventions? Uh, Behavioral change interventions, learning interventions. Can they open kids to challenges, struggle, persistence, and catalyze the effectiveness of those interventions over time. And as a final thought, let's think of adolescents with so many paths open to them, so many choices they make at those points. And think of the beliefs they have as orienting them to worse or better choices, helping them elevate to a more positive trajectory and helping them to stay on those positive trajectories over time. We feel like our work is in its infancy. We have so much we want to learn. We have so many interventions we'd love to develop and improve to really help kids get on and stay on those positive trajectories. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And and so this session is open for some questions. We'll see, we have a creative, app here, so you can either put your questions on the app or um, there's microphones in the room. It's a little hard for us to see uh, you all out there, so if somebody has a mic, just stand up and start talking. Okay, here's one. How can you encourage gro- mind, sorry, growth mindset in children who are having academic difficulties, like kids with learning disabilities? So. That's a great question, Heidi. (laughs) Um, We haven't studied kids with learning disabilities in particular, but my hunch is it's not about telling them try hard, persist. Uh, It's more about helping them find strategies that work for them and then supporting those strategies. Mm. And... um, I think this whole idea of finding strategies and finding ways of enacting strategies is really critical. There's this um, kind of belief in our society that a disproportionate number of CEOs had learning disabilities. And you might think, okay, they learn strategies for navigating not just their academic world, but for navigating the world. And they were able to use these in their lives so successfully. Uh, so that's, that's my hunch about what would work for kids with uh, learning disabilities. Here's uh-huh. a question in the back, please. Well, I'm Marco Nasa Ames. I'm really curious about what you said that thoughts and feelings live in the brain um, and challenging that with the fact that feelings might actually live in the body and they are patterned by the environment, and the first environment we experience is the nine months in the womb. Mm-hmm. So oftentimes that comes before the central nervous system development. And so what we see these days in kids is anxiety that they inherited from their mothers, their fathers, the environment. And you can, I find that you can train them no matter what in their brains. It's something that you have, it's very important, but requires a lot of maintenance. There's yeah. this negative loop that Trains, entrains the mind to the body and if they have a feeling that they've inherited that has no context the belief system that mindset doesn't work you have to go to the somatic experience mm-hmm. so oh I have so many answers to that great question absolutely um, the brain is embodied cognition is embodied um, the brain gets signals from 
the whole body, the brain is part of our interaction with the world. Um, so yes, it's all part of um, being in a body that has feelings. Um, and the brain is interpreting those feelings or the feelings are preempting certain ways of thinking in the brain. As uh, we are thinking similar things, and what we're doing now is actually combining or testing um, the effects of combining a growth mindset treatment with a mindfulness treatment that teaches kids to handle negative emotions more effectively. Because we too think, hey, yeah, you can learn. Hey, um, Mistakes don't mean you're dumb, but then you make a huge mistake and you go into a, a strong negative emotional state. So that it seems to us that the two together would be very, uh, very, very effective. Mm. <clears throat> yes, is that a question over here? Hi there, wonderful speech. I wanted to find out if you started to quantify behaviors to predict growth mindset, instead of asking questions which may be claims, yeah, have a growth mindset. Are you asking what are the questions we give to kids to quantify? Or rather, mindset? have you started to quantify to predict growth mindset? How would you predict growth mindset? Oh, well, most, oh, okay. First of all, just to clarify, we have um, questions that we ask kids. For example, your intelligence is something very basic about you that you can't really change versus everyone, no matter who they are, can become substantially smarter. Now, what causes a growth mindset? We've done research on that too. We've looked at the kinds of praise adults administer, whether they tell kids they're smart, which Kids love, but it creates more of a fixed mindset, and they don't want challenges anymore. <clears throat> um, or whether they focus on the process children engaged in to learn, which promotes more of a growth mindset. We've also looked at how parents handle children's failures. And again, this process focus really, okay, what happened? Let's think about it. What do you do next? Um, encourages more of a growth mindset. And the alternative? The alternative is <clears throat> the parent gets nervous. The parent gets anxious. The parent glosses over it. The child saying something is deeply wrong with me mm. and uh, doesn't learn from it. Mm. You want to talk a little bit? You had a study um, with ki kids taking high stakes tests or fake high stakes tests and how they got feedback on a pretest. I remember that right? How they got. Yeah, but they were told either you've, d you've done well, you must be very smart. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, we had kids. These were fifth and sixth graders. <clears throat> this was Claudia Mueller's dissertation. Right, that's right. Um, it's fant fantastic work, uh, six studies. Um, kids took uh, part of an IQ test. They were told in one group, wow, that's a really high score. You must be smart at this. Um, another group, wow, that's a really good score you must have worked really hard, or it could have been about their strategies or persistence. And then another group just, wow, that's a really good score. Then she offered them a chance to do something challenging that they could learn from, or something easy where they wouldn't make mistakes, or easy for them so they could look smart. The kids who were praised for their intelligence did not want the challenging thing they could learn from. They wanted to uphold their gifted label. Mm. Uh, then when we gave them challenging problems, those who were praised for intelligence really uh, fell apart, pretty much. 
And finally, when we ask them to report their scores to kids in another school, 40% of the kids praised for intelligence lied, and only in one direction. <laughs> so again, it measures you. And well-meaning adults saying you're so smart and thinking you're raising their confidence, and they like it in the moment, but then they need it, need it, need it. Because you're saying, it's fixed, I admire you for it, and they're saying, I better not do anything that contradicts it. This is the part that my daughter found so compelling, actually. The idea that you don't say, um, oh, you look so pretty today. You say, look at that interesting color combination you put together. Mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes it's pretty hard to yeah, find the yeah. alternative to, yeah. oh my god, you look so pretty. By the way, some parents are saying, oh, I hate it. I can't praise my child when they do well. No, I didn't say that. Of course, you can praise your child when they do well, but tie it to the process they engaged in, the improvement they made, and how they, how they made it. So uh, the general idea of um, the, the fixed mindset is that in our society, we have cre created these continua, smart to dumb, good to bad, um, uh, worthy to unworthy, and, and we measure people, and we put them on that continuum. And if you buy into that system, a person is a bunch of dots on different continua. Where's the growth? And people who aren't winners of those lotteries, what are they capable of contributing? And the alternative is to think we're all capable of growth. We all have assets that we can develop and put them together to make our unique contribution to society. Let's try to get rid of the dots on the continua and let's try to get kids excited about growing in order to make their contribution. So it leads to um, the question, are there tools available for teachers or primary care professionals or parents to help them understand whether a child has more of a growth mindset or a fixed mindset and maybe then the, the um, reparative yeah. um, activities if they have more of a yeah. fixed mindset? So we're reluctant to send out these little measures to teachers, we don't want them categorizing kids. They know which kids in their class have trouble with challenge and setbacks and feedback. Um, we, we don't want them um, uh, uh, kind of sorting kids into categories. What we do want, though, is to create professional tools that will enable them to create the culture where everyone feels comfortable to make mistakes and learn from them. You don't want another continuum on your already yeah, long list. Yeah, we don't want them it. putting dots. On. Yeah, we don't want fixed to growth mindset to be another continuum on which kids can fail or succeed. And so how young do you think you can begin um, encouraging growth mindset? Very young. Uh, we have worked with hundreds of preschool kids, and we see it emerging three, three and a half. As soon as kids can evaluate themselves, and that self-awareness really flourishes in the threes, uh, they can start worrying they're a bad person mm. if they haven't done something right, mm. and particularly if they're criticized for it. And um, just as much we've heard kids like, give little speeches on um, the importance of trying different ways and keeping at it and then asking for help. Uh, just even at that age, we see, we see the mindsets flourishing. And how old do you think you can use this, um, this perspective? Well, I'm often asked that question. I have a friend who's older, and I wonder <laughs> if... Um, so it's never too late. One of my former students, Jason Plax, 
has uh, worked with uh, the elderly and shown that a growth mindset about memory performance can really aid memory performance. And um, all, for older adults, it's particularly important. Um, uh, so many older adults don't feel they any longer have the capacity to learn. They take that critical period stuff super seriously. Oh, I couldn't learn another language. It doesn't say that. It says younger kids really learn to native proficiency. Older, you may not learn to native proficiency. So what? Yes. So you have an accent. You can still learn. So it's particularly important for people who may actually have the time to learn fantastic new things that would be so exciting to understand that they're capable of this. And so in the final moments, what are the top three things that you would recommend to promote a growth mindset? Whew. OK. <laughs> um, remember that learning and helping others learn I think those are the, about the most, or I'll say some of the most important things we can do in life. Um, to understand that everyone is capable of growth and to focus on that process of trying and strategizing and getting help. All of those, and learning from mistakes. Focus on the process that creates growth rather than measuring people and telling them, oh, here are your strengths, here are your weaknesses, and that's that. All right, with that, Carol, thank you so much. You're so welcome.